what is the essence, element, aura, star quality, charisma, whatever you want to call it, that sets one man above the rest? Is it the majestic presence of McNeil and the podium high above the pitch at Lisbon, or the intelligence, power and authority of Jock Steen? Then there is the industry of Evans or Peacock, the persuasive affability of John McPhail, or perhaps the technically sophisticated fullback play of Duncan Mackay. Must the Celtic captain possess the inspirational drive of Roy Aitken, or perhaps the military bearing of Willie Lyon? An undoubted quality would be the distinguished pedigree of the McStay family, with a century-long commitment to the traditions and the ethos of the club. Vitally essential too is the consummate professionalism and consistently excellent performance levels of Boyd, McNamara or McGrain. While the Celtic grit and fighting spirit of the old timers, Hay, Young, Kringen and Orr is retained to this day. And indeed, when we walk through a storm and paradise seems all but lost, we have been rallied and sustained by the fiery, indomitable presence of Neil Lennon. Our arms extended, eyes piercing by the Bruni, <laughs> Scott's intimidatory stare, making the characters of Norman Bates, Hannibal Lecter, <laughs> or Jack Nicholson in The Shining seem almost benign. All in that litany of inspirational leaders, have made a unique and significant contribution in their captaincy of the club. But one quality remains constant, running consistently through the ranks from the break clubs to Barca. One unifying feature has been shared by them all. For all of them, the club and the team were of preeminent importance. As one contemporary film character put it, for a captain, the badge and the name in the front of the jersey is always more important than the one in the back. Celtic captains can also draw on another traditional resource. It is what lyricist Labby Seafree has called something inside so strong, an almost indefinable quality, which throughout our history has allowed our team to achieve great things. So that even when conventional wisdom says it can't be done. It's impossible. Second best is all you can expect. Celtic teams, captains and supporters have replied in the spirit of Seafray's line, well, we're going to do it anyway. In the process, bringing back to Celtic Park the glittering prizes of the game. The Celtic captain must be a Celt on and off the field. For he's not just a leader of the players, but also of a broader community, the Celtic family. A focus for their aspirations, their dreams and their pride in the team, which for them is always more than a club. And when dreams are tossed and blown in defeat or disappointment, it is to the captain that they look to reaffirm our pride in the past and our faith in the future and reassure us that the Glasgow Celtic will be there. A grand old team was only at the dawn of its history when James Kelly made his bow as Celtic captain. Leading a team, playing in a place built by the supporters, affectionately referred to as the Old Quarters by Brother Walfred, where as Willie Maley said, that wonderful scheme of things came to fruition. It was indeed a golden period when his distinguished actor John Kearney has said the first Celts breathed a finer kind of air, imbued with the spirit of Walfred, the idealism of Dr John Conway and the drive of John Glass. And certainly in Victorian society, as someone once said, there was a buzz about the place. For Holmes and Watson, the game was afoot for the very first time. Residents of a foggy white chapel shivered when they thought of Jack the Ripper. Buffalo Bill's Wild West show with Annie Oakley, Sitting Bull and Sue Warriors was appearing in Glasgow Green. 
The cast was resident in Duke Street, where even today, in a particularly Glasgow homage, the local residents reenact battle scenes from the show regularly on a Friday and Saturday night. <laughs> Great Glasgow favourites made their first appearance. Woodbine cigarettes, the original coffin nails, Tunnock's tea time treats and Tenet's lager, an HP sauce, a must for half time pies, with quite inexplicably a label written in French. A young Stan Laurel was still blissfully unaware of the terrors of the Tron Gates panoptican audiences, who threw fish heads, rotten eggs and fruit, and material deposited by horses on the pavements outside at unfortunate performers before they were mercifully rescued by the hook. Yes, Glasgow in that day was definitely the city where no turn was left unstoned. <laughs> Poetic epitaphs may have been written for Tennyson, Manley Hopkins and Browning. But Celtic supporters could still wax lyrical, for bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. Kelly-led Celtic was a team of superstars, even before the term was invented. They thrilled and entertained. They were billed theatrically as the greatest team in the world. They were certainly the best damn team in Scotland and beyond. James Kelly led a galaxy of stars, legends, remembered wherever green is worn. Willie Maley, later to be a manager without equal, the man who made the Celtic. Johnny Madden, the master of back heels, flicks and feints and swerves, a deep thinker in the game, remembered today as the father of Czech football. Deadly goal scorer, Neely McCallum, the shadow, the great Johnny Campbell, a double winner on both sides of the border, captain of his country, and a top scorer in the English League. And what a sense of occasion he had, scoring inaugural goals at the great cathedrals of football in Tyneside and in Birmingham. Sandy McMahon, the Duke, tearing defences apart with pace and power, leaving despairing defenders in his wake. And they had personalities. At fullback, Jerry Reynolds, the man with the iron head, and the larger than life figure of Dan Doyle, the wild rover, flamboyant, glamorous, romantic. On his deathbed, he said, At least my old legs have made a little bit of Celtic history. And then, of course, there was James Kelly himself, a world class performer for Trenton, a Scottish internationalist, two Scottish Cup winners before joining Celtic, a dynamic attacking centre half, dominating and controlling games, strong in the tackle and powerful in the air, and with a goal or two in his locker, often celebrated with a dramatic, joyous triple somersault. And he understood that very modern methodology of psyching out opponents, of unsettling and unnerving them. On one 